Welcome once again, beautiful people of God, inviting all of you uh, and, and myself into God's word today. And uh, I'm just going to preface uh, today's message uh, teaching by saying that you might hear some things that challenge what you've believed and assumed to be true in the past. And um, as Andrew was praying, he, he mentioned new things. Um, and there might be a new thing that you might receive from the Lord today. As for myself, my heart and my mind and my soul has always been, Lord, change anything that I've assumed to be true, which is not really true. Show me in your word and lead me and guide me to your truth. The purpose of the Holy Spirit, one of the purposes was that he will guide us and lead us into all truth. He was sent for correction. So may he correct and change us and lead us to his truth. So with that heart posture of each one of us, uh, let's enter into today's study. So Matthew 13. So Matthew 13, you see something interesting where Yeshua says, or it is said of him, that he begins to teach in parables. Matthew 13, verse 3. It says, and he told them many things in parables. And you know a lot of the parables. You're familiar with many of them. In fact, uh, just in Matthew 13 is the famous parable of the, the one who sows, the sower, right? Where the seed lands on four diff different types of soil. And the end result of each of those seeds are very different depending on where they landed. We're all familiar with the parable of the sower. There is another parable, which is... Um, also interesting, the first one I'm not going to go over because all of us know, know, know that parable pretty, pretty well. The second one has to do with um, has to do with the end times actually. has to do with some events that are going to precede the last day um, uh, last day events. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes, although this is not a study on eschatology or last day events, just because the parable is there and Yeshua spent some time going over it and teaching it. We're going to look at that for a second or for a few minutes, and then we'll come back and look at the meaning of parables, right? Not the meaning of any particular parable. What is the purpose behind the parable? Why did he use this medium of parables? Could he not just have spoken plainly? He could have. Why parables? So first we look at uh, the parable that shows up in verse 24. So Matthew 13, verse 24. He presented to them another parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good field in his field. But while the men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Now when the stalk sprouted and produced grain, then the weeds also appeared. And some of us know this parable as the parable of the wheats, wheat and the tares. Same, same, same parable. Uh, so the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Master, did you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? But he replied, an enemy did this. And the slaves say to him, do you want us then to go out and gather them up? But he says, no. For while you're gathering up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I will tell the reapers, first gather up the weeds and tie them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. This is Yeshua speaking of events which will precede his coming. Um, and and I, and, and he actually explains this parable in, um, later on in verse 36, because the disciples ask him, can you explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field? So verse 37, he answered, the one sowing the good seed is the son of man. And the field is the world. And the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest 
is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Very clearly defined, right? Each of the uh, personalities in the parable, all clearly laid out. Verse 40, therefore, just as the weeds are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who practice lawlessness. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, and that place will be, will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Some of this is really clear, so I'm not going to belabor those um, points as to who, who is the, the one who sows the good seed and the enemy. All of that is clearly specified, so I'm not going to spend time on that. But what I found was interesting, if you go back, not to the explanation, but to the original saying of the parable itself, in verse 30, it says, let both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I will tell the reapers. Pay attention to the words. What does he say? I'll tell the reapers. First, gather up the weeds and tie them in bundles. The word first is actually the word uh, proton in Greek, like proto. Proto is always first. Uh, like the proto-evangelion is how you would say the first time the gospel message is proclaimed, which is Genesis 3.15. The theologians refer to Genesis 3.15, you know, where it said the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That is a proto-evangelion, and that is, the proto means first, the first proclamation of the gospel. So here when it says first gather of the weeds, that same word proton or proto is used. But the word um, that she, that is, uh, then talks about you know, after you gather up the weeds, then you gather up the wheat. There is a connection word, and that connection word is and now or after, and that's the Greek word day. So it is very specific, and it is intentional that first you gather up the, the, the tares and, and, and then the wheat, or you gather up the weeds first and then the wheat. What does this mean? Uh, it means that the church or the believers are going to be here, going to be here while the unrighteous ones are still here. We're going to be here together. We are not going to be removed first while the tares or the weeds are being judged and burnt. Okay? So I don't want to go into a lot of details on pre and um, post, but you can understand. I'll, I'll let you kind of Think about the implications of that. But I, I, this is the first time I saw it in this parable, this, the, the order, right? And going back to Yeshua's explanation of the parable, I want to point out one other thing. Verse 42, they will throw them, meaning the sons of the evil one, they will throw them into the fiery furnace, and that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as sun, as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This language of let the, that the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father is actually um, not just some language Yeshua just made up here. It is actually a reference to a prophecy given to Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. And Daniel chapter 12, uh, the verses that I'm about to um, give you, in fact, is one of the few places in the Tanakh which actually teaches the doctrine of the resurrection. If you've ever wondered what, if there was any mention of the resurrection in the Tanakh, this same passage has it. So Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands God over the sons of your people will arise. Uh, that means Michael is standing God over Israel. That's what it means. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since the beginning of the nation until then. This is talking about a time future to Daniel. In fact, even future to us. But at that time, your people, 
everyone who is found written in the book. Which book? The book of life. That's not just the remnant of Israel who are in the book of life, but that's also us from the nations. But at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. That's the teaching on resurrection. Some to everlasting life, and that is the body of Messiah, receiving our glorified bodies, and others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavenly expanse. And those who turn many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. Yeshua is connecting Daniel 12 to that parable, which is really a parable of the end times. So that was just an insight into one of the parables that Yeshua has given us, which sheds light on how things are going to unfold and the order of events during the end times. But let's come back to the whole question about parables. Um, Back to Matthew 13, Matthew 13, verse 34. It says, all these things Yeshua spoke to the crowds in parables. And apart from a parable, he wasn't speaking to them. Let me repeat that again. And apart from a parable, he wasn't speaking to them. Which means not only was he using parables to teach the crowds, he was only using parables to teach the crowds because he wasn't speaking anything to them that was not a parable. I'm not saying he didn't say anything else. Of course, he did a lot of things, but when he was teaching and specifically sharing about the, the mysteries of the kingdom, the secrets of the kingdom, parable. And why? Um, in order to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet, this is the prophet um, Isaiah. I'll open my mouth in parables. I'll utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Actually, that's from Psalm 78. Um, we look at Isaiah in a second. This is actually from Psalm 78. So when the king of glory, Yeshua comes, when the Messiah comes, it was already prophesied in the Psalms that he's going to open his mouth in parables. Yeshua teaching in parables was prophesied. And second, it's saying when he teaches in parables, one of the things, one of the purposes of teaching in parables is to reveal things that were hidden since the foundation of the world. Imagine that Moses and the prophets and all the righteous ones of the past have not seen certain things, which are only going to be revealed when Yeshua is going to speak in parables. So there are going to be new things revealed through parables. But is everything, is, is the entire purpose and the reason behind parables to reveal things, to reveal new things? On one hand, as we just read, yes, it is going to bring forth things that were hidden since the foundation of the world. In fact, when we read Daniel chapter 12 a few minutes ago, uh, that same chapter, Daniel 12 says, Daniel, you just, you just write down what I just revealed to you and close it up. There will be people who come in the future time whose eyes will be opened and they will understand what you don't understand. I mean, Daniel was a wise man. You know, he interpreted the king's dreams. He had great revelation, but there were some things that were hidden even from Daniel and they are yet to be revealed at the future time. And we are in that future time. So on one hand, yes, there's revelation of new things coming through the parables, but there is another purpose. And let's read verse 10 of Matthew 13. So you have to imagine that the disciples who, to whom Yeshua has been speaking plainly, they suddenly see him speaking in parables and they're, they're befuddled and they're saying, Lord, what are you doing? Why, why are you teaching in parables? Why don't you just speak plainly? So in verse 10, the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? Master, we've noticed that when the crowds are here, you're teaching in parables. Why are you using parables? 
So here is the answer and the, and the other purpose of the parable. So one purpose was to reveal new things. And here is the other purpose of the parables. He replied to them, to you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been given. Let me just stop there. What does that mean? To you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. By the way, the Greek uses the word uh, mysteria, like mysterious or mystery, right? The mystery of the kingdoms of heaven has been given to you to understand and not been given to them. And he's saying this is the reason he's speaking in parables. Now, we have to understand what it means. What does he mean when he says, when he says it has been given? What does it mean? The Greek word for given is didomi. It is like when someone offers you something, right? I'm giving you something, then the word would be didomi. So Yeshua is actually saying it has been granted or permitted by the Father for some of you to understand, to comprehend the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Conversely, for others, it has not been permitted, it has not been approved to be released. This release of knowledge has not been approved to be given to them. Are you hearing this? This is a difficult teaching, right? All of us are now questioning, wow, okay. Are you saying we are just chosen? He chose some to reveal himself and his son and others he did not. He just passed over them. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying this. I'm just interpreting as best as I can what God's word is saying. So this brings to, this is why I said today's teaching is going to be a little challenging and uh, challenging our assumptions that we might have held to be true in the past. So this gets to the other question. How do we, how does anybody come to know Messiah? How does anybody come to enter the kingdom of God? Why does one person receive the gospel and the other person does not? Let's say you and your best friend in college, together you went to a Billy Graham crusade. You're sitting next to each other. You both have done the same stupid and bad things, right? No one is better than the other. But you receive, you understand, you receive, and your, and your friend doesn't. Is it because somehow you're inherently better than your friend? Would you say that? <laughs> so what is the explanation? Maybe this is the answer to that question. Again, it is a difficult teaching that God gave or permitted some to know and receive and others he did not. So as you're scratching your head and, and asking the question, what is John saying? Let me give you a few more scripture verses, which will help you kind of settle this question. This is an important question. Um, so I'm going to give you a few scripture verses. Meditate on them after we are done. Study them. Sleep over them. Just, just sit with them for a while and let God convince you of his truth. Um, all right. So the first verse I'm going to give you is John, John's Gospel. Chapter 6, verse 44. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless my Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to me unless my Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. I don't know how else to explain, interpret this, because it's too plain. The Father has to draw you to me, and that's the only way you will believe in me. That's what it's saying. Unless the Father draws you to me, you're not going to come to me. And if the Father draws you to me, you will come, and I will raise you up on the last day. He's saying, I'm faithful to all those who have come to me, I will raise you up on the last day. But the Father has to draw you, otherwise you cannot come. Is that the only verse that teaches this? I'll show you a few more verses. Luke 10, uh, Luke chapter 10. Luke 
verses 20 through 24. Luke 10, 20 through 24. Actually, 21 through 24. In that very hour, he was overjoyed. He is Yeshua, Jesus. He was overjoyed in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Master of the universe, that you have hidden these things from the wise and discerning and revealed them to infants. We are the infants of whom he speaks. <laughs> Yes, Father, for this way was pleasing to you. Yeshua is saying, this is right. This is good. How you have revealed to some and you have kept it from others. Verse 22. All things have, handed, have been handed over to me by my Father. And here is the verse. No one knows who the Son is except the Father and who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Whoa. I'll read that again. No one knows who the son is except the father. And no one knows who the father is except the son. And anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. In other words, no one knows the father. No one can know the father unless the son chooses to reveal the father to him. We just read two verses, very interesting, complementary verses. The first one from John 6, 44 said, unless the father draws you to me, you cannot come to me. And here in Luke 10 saying, unless I choose you, you will not know the father. Is that enough proof? I'll give you two more. <laughs> Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, who has who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Messiah. He chose us, here it comes, he chose us in the Messiah before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us, who predestined us, for adoption as sons through Messiah Yeshua. I'll just stop there. So two key phrases. He chose us in the Messiah when? Before the foundation of the world. Not, not, he didn't choose me after I was sitting in Billy Graham's evangelistic crusade and said, I raised my hand, I went up for the altar call, right? That's not when he chose me. He chose me before the foundation of the world because Billy Graham came after the foundation of the world. So everything else happened after. So now you can put things in perspective and say, the reason I lifted my hand and said, yes, I want to receive the Lord is because I was chosen before the foundation of the world. Are those enough verses? I'll give you one more. And this is it. <laughs> Revelation 13. I mean, there are a lot more verses, but I wanted to give you like the key ones to meditate, meditate on and memorize. Revelation 13, verses 7 to 9. He was also permitted to make war against the holy ones and overcome them. And he was given authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth shall worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. I'll stop right there. So your name was written in the book of life of the lamb. When? for the foundation of the world. So we were called before the foundation of the world. In fact, we came to Messiah because we were called before the foundation of the world, because our name was written in the book of life. If you understood and if you understand and say yes to what you just heard, right? Then all glory, right? For your salvation. From beginning to end, goes to him. I can't even take credit by saying, yes, um, I put my faith in the Lord and I believed and that. Oh, you put your faith in the Lord because you were chosen before the foundation of the world. I, I can't take any credit at all, as it should be, right? I should, there's no credit for me. All glory, honor, and praise to him. Just to recap for a second. The purpose of the parables. One was to reveal new things. 
And the other we just finished reading was to keep things hidden. Keep things hidden from whom? From those for whom it was not given. To some it was given and for others it was not given. So the purpose of the parables, the second purpose, purpose of the parables was to keep it concealed. Let's keep reading. Verses 11 and 12 we read already. And let's pick up in verse 13. For this reason I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see. And hearing they do not hear. Nor do they understand. And in them. Uh, Yeshua is actually quoting from Isaiah chapter 6 now. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. Which says you will keep on hearing but will never understand. You will keep looking but will never see. For the heart of this people has become dull. Their ears can barely hear, and they've shut their eyes. Otherwise, here's, a, here's another twist to this whole thing. It says, otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. Then they would turn back, and I would heal them. Whoa, this is getting more difficult. Do you, do you see what he's saying? One, he's choosing, right, to whom revelation should be given and to whom it should not be given. And he's saying, if to those for whom it is not to be given, if I did reveal it to them, guess what's going to happen to them? <laughs> they will understand and they'll come back and they will be healed. Wow. Right? Again, I'm just reading. I'm just reading the text. Um, so do you understand what a blessing? And it's like the, if you think of lot, winning a lottery ticket or hitting the jackpot, I mean, this is like a million times more than that. How blessed you are in being chosen. Look at Yeshua's words in verse 16. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Verse 17. Amen, I tell you, many a prophet and sadiq or a righteous long to see what you are seeing, but they did not see. And to hear what you're, what you're hearing and did not hear. This is what I was saying earlier, right? There have been things that are revealed to you and I in this present age that was hidden even from the saints of old. And blessed are you because your eyes are actually seeing. Your ears are actually hearing the words and comprehending the mysteries and secrets of my kingdom. That's what Yeshua is saying. You're not done. There's more. So why, why does, why does Yeshua, why, why does God, why did God plan things out this way? Um, Acts 28, verses 16 through 28. So the context here is uh, the Apostle Paul, who is, um, who is officially a prisoner of Rome. And there is the, the Roman gods are following him. And, but he, he's given a lot of freedom, but he is officially a prisoner of Rome at this point in Acts 28. Um, so let's read from verse, verse 16. When, when we entered Rome, so this is Paul speaking. So they've entered Rome. Uh, Paul was permitted to remain in his own quarters with a soldier guarding him. It happened that after three days, Paul called together those who were um, the promised, sorry, those who were the prominent Jewish leaders. All right, so Paul is in Rome, and he has some freedom, uh, so he can invite people over to his house. And so what he does is when he arrives in Rome, he invites, sends an invitation out to all of the leaders of the Jewish community, and he invites them to come over to his place. When they had gathered, he said to them, brothers, although I had done nothing against our people, meaning the Jews, the Israelites, or the customs of our fathers, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they examined me, they wanted to release me because there was no basis for the death penalty. But when the Judean leaders prote protested, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, since it is for the hope of Israel that I'm bearing this chain. Mm -hmm. Interesting language. Uh, again, that's not our main point, but hope. The hope of Israel is Messiah Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And I am in chains for the sake of the gospel. That's, that's what he's saying. Um, moving on. 
They said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. In other words, oh, all the stuff that you're saying has happened to you or other people have uh, alleged uh, that you've done um, wrong against our people and our nation. We haven't heard anything about this. Um, verse 22, but we think it appropriate to hear from you about what you think. So nevertheless, tell us what you think. We don't know what these other Jewish people have been saying. We haven't received the CNN and the MSNBC, right? We haven't received any of those reports. You're a clean slate. You tell us what you're thinking, right? For indeed, it is known to us that regarding the sect, it is spoken against in all the places. So the one thing that we do know is this, this group that is following you and subscribing to your teaching, we know that people don't like this group. That much we know, but beyond that, we don't know what they believe. So you tell us. Verse 23, they set a day to meet Paul and came to, came to him at his quarters in large numbers. So a day was set that they would come and Paul would teach them. From morning until evening, he was explaining everything to them, testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them about Yeshua from both the Torah of Moses and the prophets. Verse 24, some were convinced by what he said, but others refused to believe. This is, a, this is a, actually what we just, all the things that we just read in action, right? The same group of people, you know, they heard Paul's teaching. Some of them uh, believed, others refused to believe. So when they disagreed among themselves, so now the two groups are arguing, right? They came in as one group. Imagine, you know, you and your friends, hey, let's call this guy, Paul. He's in town. And, you know, those uh, people that uh, everybody's against, uh, you know, Paul's there, one of their leaders. Let's go listen to what these guys say. And now you believe what Paul said and your friend who came with you, whom you invited. Like, no, I don't, I don't believe this. Now you're arguing with each other, okay? That's what's happening. So when they disagreed among themselves, they began leaving after Paul had said one last statement. So now they're disagreeing. They heard everything. Some believed, some did not. And they're you know, heading back to their home. But Paul made one last statement before they left. He said, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your father saying, Paul is about to quote the exact same prophecy from Isaiah that Yeshua quoted when the disciples asked him, why do you speak in parables? Paul says, Go to this people and say, you'll keep on hearing, but you'll never understand. You'll keep looking, but you'll never see. For this heart, for the heart of this people has become dull. Their ears can barely hear, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. Then they would turn back, and I would heal them. Exact same quote that Yeshua gave is what Paul gives. Because he saw what was happening. He explained the kingdom, how to enter the, you know, the principles of the kingdom. He, he explained that Messiah is the way to the kingdom. And then he saw this group that came in now split up into two subgroups. One received the message, the others did not. And he's saying, oh, this is exactly what Isaiah spoke of. Paul and Yeshua are thinking, going back to the same prophet, same prophet. Is that amazing? Um, so Paul has a few more things to say, actually. After he cites the prophecy from Isaiah, he says the following in verse 28. So it's still in Acts 28, but verse 28, it says, therefore, in other words, because these people who have heard the gospel, they, they, they can't receive it, they can't understand which people, the Jewish people to whom it was given first, right? Some of whom did believe. So we're not talking about the entire nation of Israel or all of the Jewish people. If God chose those from among the Jewish people to believe, they would believe. And they did believe. But he's saying of the rest who did not believe, right, which was the majority. Paul says, therefore, in light of what I'm seeing, in light of what's happening in our nation, that the majority have rejected Messiah. Paul says in verse 28, therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. Let me read that again. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. 
So the concealment of the message from Israel was also to the benefit of the Gentiles to whom the message would go out now. And many from them would come and receive. And many from the nations, and most of us are from uh, the nations, and we have been grafted in. We have been grafted into the covenant promise of Israel, and we have come to believe. And again, why did you and I come to believe? Because your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. All glory to God. What a, what a blessing. What a blessing that he chose us. When you start praying from now on, when you worship God, include this in your prayer. Thank you, Abba, for choosing me. If you had not chosen me, I would not come to you. As plain and simple as that. And this is why there is a scripture that even says, faith is a gift of God. Right? Right? I did not muster up the faith to believe, right? So you might say, okay, okay, I was chosen before the foundation of the world, but I then had to believe, right? Even that faith is a gift from God. The scriptures say, it. so this, this is a lot um, to digest, and, but, but note, note down the references and meditate on them and ask the Holy Spirit to confirm, either confirm what I'm saying or reject it and give you a proper understanding, but meditate on these things. Now, I, I want to close out in a few minutes and, um, and pick up on the last thing Paul just said, which is because the message has been kept hidden from some of the Jewish nation. Now, therefore, the gospel is going to go out to the nations and and there will come people from the nations who will listen and believe. I, I want to now take that aspect of, uh, or the understanding of Gentiles coming in, right? And actually connect it to the covenant promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because uh, I feel like historically, and I'm not, painting in broad strokes here, but historically the, uh, a good part of the church, especially the Gentile believers, we have failed to recognize that when we were brought in, and even using the term brought in, so just that you're brought into something that pre-existed, you're being brought in to the covenant promises of Israel. God does not have a, another path just for the Gentiles, apart from Israel, apart from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He does not. It's not in the scriptures. So I want to take a few minutes just to show you that when the Gentiles were brought in, they were brought in and grafted into the covenant promises of Israel. If you don't get this, you won't understand the, the full picture of Yeshua's kingdom. You'll have like a, your subgroup. Uh, you'll understand something, but you'll be disconnected from the big picture of how the kingdom works. And that we are connected to Israel. Um, so we'll take a we'll look at a few verses. So let's go to um, so Romans eleven verse eleven says. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole the whole verse, just the second part of it. It says, "By their false step, meaning Israel, ethnic Israel, by their false step, salvation has come to the Gentiles." I'll just stop there. So by their false steps, salvation has come to the Gentiles, which is what Paul basically said. Look, you guys, my fellow Jewish brothers, you're not believing? Now the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles, right? Same thing in Romans 11. By your false steps, salvation has gone to the Gentiles. But why, why does it have to be the expense of them, right? Why did they have to make a false step to bring the Gentiles in? Could the Gentiles have not come in regardless? Lots of questions. We'll ask that question to the Father when we see him, but we have some insight, some insight, some revelation given to us in Revelation 11, okay? So we'll talk about those things that are revealed to us. So Revelation 11, um, verse 24 says, you were cut off, uh, sorry, you, meaning the Gentiles, 
you were cut out of that which by nature is a wild olive tree. So all of my brothers and sisters who do not have uh, the um, blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob flowing through you, we belong to wild olive trees, okay? That, that's, that's what scripture is saying. And uh, verse 24, it continues to say, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. So contrary to our nature, we were cultivated into a, oh, sorry, we were, we were grafted into a cultivated olive tree. Let me just stop there. So the cultivated olive tree is Israel. God has been cultivating them, right? God has been taking care of them. Uh, I'm, I'm going back in time all the way to Abraham, choosing Abraham, and then through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, creating a whole nation. And then he's been giving them the Torah, his instructions. He's been discipling them and disciplining them as a loving father with his children, punishing them when they did not follow his ways and blessing them when they kept his ways, right? Just like you and I would instruct our little children. So he's been cultivating them. They're the cultivated olive tree. We belong to our forefathers came from that stock, which did not have the Torah, did not have Moses and the prophets, but we are, we've been grafted in to the natural olive tree of Israel. Verse um, 17, uh, Romans 11. But if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, let me just stop there. This is how you were grafted in. So we were branches broken off from the wild olive tree, grafted into the natural olive tree, which is Israel, or the cultivated olive tree, which is Israel. But verse 17 says, some of the branches were broken off and you were grafted in among them. In other words, room was made for you by breaking off some of the branches that belong to the cultivated olive tree of Israel. Now do you understand and see why the some among the chosen people, when they're rejected, Paul is saying they are the branches that were broken off so that you could be grafted in. So their disbelieving or unbelief, the unbelief and our being grafted in are all connected. So, so come, let's just bring everything back together in Matthew 13. Parables. Yeshua, in everything that he did, even in his teaching, the way he instructed them through the parables, he was accomplishing all of the purposes of the Father from, which were predetermined from the beginning. And everything that he did, <laughs> accomplishing something. There was not a single thing that he did, which was just arbitrary, which didn't do anything. Right? You and I may, you know, have a go, a go, you know, maybe we'll go and have a cup of coffee. What did that accomplish? I don't know, right? But everything Yeshua is doing is intentional. His choosing parables to keep the revelation from going to some was so that you and I would be grafted in. How amazing is that? He knows who belongs to him, right? And he will move heaven and earth. And indeed, he moved heaven and earth to bring all those who belong to him, whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, right? He brought, he's bringing all those who belong to him. He's gathering, gathering us in. He says, no one that the father has given to me will I lose, right? He is guaranteeing, he's guaranteeing that we will be raised up at the last day. So if you and I are, are <laughs> depending on, your walk today or last week, you might be saying, oh, I messed up again. I did something terrible. And then I did this terrible thing, not just the first time or second time. This is like the millionth time I'm doing it. Certainly God's patience has been exhausted. I'm out. No, that is man's theology. That's not what God is saying. I'm choosing you. I'm calling you. You will come. And if you came to me, I will raise you up at the last day. That's great news, isn't it? That is good news. That is good news. So those who are teaching that, you know, you can come in today, you can fall out tomorrow. That is not the teaching of the kingdom. That teaching still has a lot of our flesh contributing to our, to our being with the Lord. No, there's no room for the flesh. Let's pray. Abba, Father, we just thank you. We praise you, worship you. <laughs> For this blessing of opening our eyes. Who are we that you chose us, each one of us? You plucked us out from different families and nations, and you, 
you drew us to yourself. And if you did not, we would not come to you. Our eyes would not be open. We would not believe. So we just want to thank you today for just opening our eyes and causing us to come in, submit to the obedience of the gospel, submitting to the obedience of Yeshua, and choosing to love him and obey him every single day. You made this happen. We thank you and we praise you that you caused this to happen. Thank you, Abba. Yeshua's name, Amen. I receive the Aaronic benediction. Yivarecha Adonai Bayish Marecha. Yair Adonai Panavelecha, Vikunecha. Yisa Adonai Panavelecha, Vyasem Lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom through the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, the sure Messiah. Amen, Amen, Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you.